So thank you very much to uh, to WWF Stockholm Environment Institute and Scandia for uh, inviting me here today. We we have a very strong connection with Sweden actually, although we're based in London, because our work is based very closely on the work of the Natural Step. Uh, hands up, who's heard of the Natural Step? Wow, you say that in any other country in the world? <laughs> There's nothing, maybe one or two hands. One of the best kept secrets in the sustainability profession. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time setting the scene because Johan did a fantastic job of that. Um, but we've done some incredible things. This is Shanghai 30 years ago and Shanghai five years ago. 25 years difference in those two photos. Right? So we can, we can change the world around us, uh, but our impact's not always predictable. Anyone shout out who knows what that is? Have a guess. It's a bird's nest found on a roof of a building in Tokyo made out of coat hangers because the crows couldn't find enough twigs and had learned that they could steal coat hangers instead. So it's ingenious, but quite depressing. <laughs> what about this one? Anyone guess what that is? It's OK, so it's a honeycomb from a beehive. Um, but when the farmers, the beekeepers rather, took this out of the hive in the south of France a few years ago, they couldn't understand why there's all these blues and greens and reds and so on, um, until they followed the bees and found them going to the waste behind an M&M's factory, because it was a much easier source of sugar for them than going around the flowers. So, you know, if you're five years old, maybe you want to spread that on your toast in the morning but most people don't, so the harvest was ruined. So we're, our impact isn't always predictable in any way. Um, you've seen plenty of photos like this, Johan was showing some as well. That's just the stomach contents of one albatross chick. Um, this looks like it was taken 100 years ago, but actually it was last year in, um, in Beijing. Look at those smokestacks, it's just, just nuts. Um, the, the disparity between the people that have lots and people that don't is just incredible. Why everyone needs a swimming pool on their balcony, I, I don't know. Um, and of course, it's these things are all interconnected. So we have a, the massive refugee crisis in Europe. And what often goes unsaid is that a lot of the, the pressure in Syria that led to the problems we've got today, not all of it, but a big factor was failed harvests due to more extreme weather events, two years in a row which meant there was mass migration to the cities of the coast where the infrastructure couldn't sustain the, uh, the incoming population. So that was part of the pressure cooker that has resulted in this stuff. So these environmental and social issues are all heavily interconnected. Um, if you look at all of these graphs, uh, the numbers here, the red ones you can't quite see, that's 1950. So we're really um, both um, hitting planetary boundaries, exceeding them in some cases, and our um, use of uh, resources and so forth is going through the roof. And it, we're on a finite planet. We have to live within its carrying capacity if we're to ever reach the uh, state of sustainability. So we've got to rethink how we do business. And to do that, we need to rethink how we value business. So Johan, one of the few things I understood from his talk was you mentioned Donella Meadows report how to intervene in a system. Everyone, homework today when you leave this conference is to go and read that. It's only about 10 pages long and it's absolutely fantastic for anyone who's seeking to understand where they can have influence, whether it's within their own business or globally. Um, and the thing is, our, our entire economic system is focused on GDP as the measure of good growth and value. Um, and we do need a system that pursues increased prosperity, but we need to redefine what we mean by value. Um, it used to be that we all talked about shareholder value, where businesses could legitimately focus on financial returns at the expense of everything else. And actually, it was good business sense to externalize every environmental and social cost you could um, and privatize the gains. More recently, the last 15 years or so, we've had the notion of the triple bottom line. One of, one of our advisors, John Elkington, came up with that phrase. Um, more recently, it kind of evolved into the idea of creating shared value. 
was a nice idea. It kind of sounds a bit like shareholder value, but nicer. So you can see why it resonates with CEOs. But the typical framing of the triple bottom line is, is these um, slightly overlapping circles, which is unhelpful. Because if you're not really understanding it in depth, it looks like a lot of business exists independently of society and the environment. And often the shared value framing um, is used either to justify or at least focus on the good bits by ignoring the bad bits. And what we need is to rethink things in systems terms. So we talk in terms of system value, which is that business is addressing societal issues in a holistic way so that it's not hindering progress to a flourishing future elsewhere. It doesn't matter how great your products are and how good a story you can tell about how environmentally efficient they are, if the only way you can bring them to market profitably is by using child labor in your supply chain, for example. So we need to look at this holistically, and that's what the FutureFit Business Benchmark sets out to do. Um, typically, we think of sustainability performance, and most companies report their sustainability performance backwards looking, here's what we've done, rather than focusing on where we need to be and setting goals and targets around that. And we're going to hear from Dell shortly, um, the only other talk today that I will understand, um, where um, they have actually they're one of the first companies to set targets around uh, greenhouse gas emissions that do their fair share to keep us within the global carbon budget, which is great. But there are plenty of other things companies need to do to be sure that they're in no way undermining progress to a um, sustainable future. So we have to focus on the future, not what we've done. I don't care how well you did last year. How far have you got to go until you're doing no harm? That's the important thing. Okay. And the only way you can define that is based on best available science, our understanding of what it's going to take to, uh, to make society sustainable. The third thing about this is we wanted this to be a useful tool. There's, it doesn't matter how kind of technically good something is if people don't want to use it and don't actually find it useful. And um, it's free to use. We're a non-profit uh, based in the UK um, and everything we do, we create and publish as a public good. So we start with a definition that, um, sorry, I, I'm not looking at my phone because I'm checking my Twitter feed. It's because I've been told I've got exactly 10 minutes to speak. Um, so we start with a clear definition that future fit business is one that creates value while in no way undermining and ideally increasing the possibility humans and other life will flourish on Earth forever. I'm happy to share the slides afterwards, incidentally, if anyone wants them. Um, how do you turn that into reality? Well, this is where the natural step stuff comes in. Fantastic work that was kicked off about 28 years ago by one of your fellow Swedes, Carl Henrik Robert, um, to actually define what are the system conditions within which society would need to operate to ensure this possibility that humans and other life can flourish on Earth forever. It's not about utopia, it's just ensuring the possibility that that can happen. These system conditions are at the core of that. Um, originally there were four. About six or seven years ago, they started work on unpacking what the social system condition meant, which is the, the second one there. It's actually been broken down into five system conditions now, which are much more actionable for business. Even so, put this in front of the typical CEO, and she's not really going to know, what does that mean for me as a business? How do I ensure I meet this threshold? So that's where the benchmark comes in. So what we've done is we've taken that as a starting point, and through a consultation process with experts and the general public over a three-year period, um, we turned it into a set of what we call break-even goals. So collectively, these 21 goals define the break-even point for business on the environmental and social dimensions of the triple bottom line. We've all heard the term triple bottom line, but really if you think about it, we only know what break-even looks like on the financial one. You have to make as much money as you spend, or you're not going to last very long. We've defined the equivalent for the environmental and social bottom lines, so we can understand exactly how much companies need to do before they're causing no harm, and we can also identify the companies which are having a positive contribution to society. So the first release came out in May of last year. You can download it and use it now for free, um, which sets out these 21 goals. There's just three examples that help you measure progress toward this break-even point. So it provides a north star for business when it comes to sustainability. Um, 
had a set of indicators measuring progress toward them. And we've designed it to be as simple as possible for companies to use. And, and at the highest level, you can just put a, measure all of these things as a simple percentage in terms of where you need to be. Um, that's great, and it's really important. But it doesn't tell the full story, because a lot of companies are actually doing a lot of good in the world. So the second release, which is scheduled for this September, and we're working on now, um, also measures all of the positive ways a company can create system value by accelerating the future fitness of the system as a whole through its interactions with others, whether it's enabling its customers to become future fit or working with its suppliers to do so and so forth. Um, so I'm running out of time. So very quickly, um, two quick use cases, how you can start using this today. Well, the SDGs, we're going to hear a bit more about the SDGs today, the Sustainable Development Goals. It's fantastic that we have this agenda 2030 to say what we need to aim for by then, 17, targ 17 goals, 169 targets. It's not company specific. It's actually quite hard if you're a company to look down this list and think, well, what do we do about this? Um, and the danger is, and we've seen this already, some companies have gone out and looked down this list of targets and thought, oh, we can say something good about that one and that one. And that one, excellent, we've got an SDG strategy. Let's go back to business as usual, because we've, we've dealt with that one, which is really missing the point. What we've done is we've mapped the future fit break-even point to the SDGs, and you can look at all this online and see how they interact, and basically say, if you're not pursuing this break-even point, here's how you might be unintentionally undermining progress elsewhere. So if you're relying on a supplier who uses a very water-intensive production process and they're in a water stress region, you are actively contributing to the water stress challenges of the communities in that region. So you're undermining progress. Even though you might not intentionally be doing so, this is something that you're mutually accountable for. Second use case, very simple. I mentioned that we have these 21 break-even goals. Um, we have a, what we call a workshop in a box where you can print these out, postcards, download from our website. It's not quite on the website yet, so if anyone really wants this quickly, come and see me afterwards. Otherwise, um, it'll be up in a few weeks. Um, and basically, you can just go through these goals and run your own workshop. We have a facilitation guide and stuff. And the reason for this is that typically when we've done this with companies, some goals don't really apply based on the company's business model. That's fine. Most goals, People look at you and say, well, that's going to take years and a lot of time and effort and management will. Well, yeah, of course it is. The economy is unsustainable. We all need to do a lot to change that. But typically, two or three goals, people look at and think that's impossible. No way we can get there. And what they mean is that's impossible within the context of our current business model. That's the conversation they need to be having. How can we overcome those things that look impossible by rethinking our overall business model? So there are two use cases, just two last points. The first is that typically the way we look at sustainability performance and measure so-called environmental social governance, ESG performance in companies is through this idea of ratings, like things like Dow Jones sustainability rating and um, good guide and so on. And all these things are flawed in two ways. They look at current best practice versus tomorrow's required practice as defined by science. So you end up with distorted views like an oil company being rated as 87% sustainable because it's compared with other oil companies, which is nuts. And the second thing is that companies, the way that these companies are scored is they have to spend hundreds of hours filling in questionnaires to send them off to a rater who then tells them how sustainable they are and they get no value out of this, there's nothing actionable. So the whole point of this being an open source tool which companies use themselves is that this is actually a valuable tool to guide decisions around innovation within your business. Only if and when you wish to publish this information for others to see, investors and consumers and so on, do you then need to get in an independent assurer to check that you've applied the framework in the right way. Um, Grant Thornton, world's sixth biggest accounting and assurance firm, is building that assurance process for us. Um, these are some of the other companies we're working with on the uh, journey to future fitness who are helping us. You'll notice there are no Swedish companies there. Um, there are lots of companies that have downloaded this thing and are using it. We don't require them to let us know. These are the companies we work very closely with as learning partners to refine the benchmark and make sure it works across all sectors. So if there's anyone in the room 
that thinks this might be of relevance to them, please get in touch. And I'm going to skip the summary. Okay, thank you.